Hey, I'm Dante Stack, one of the team members here at Veracity Hill, and I kind of hate apologetics. So, to be clear, in this video, I would like to offer one hypothesis, or premise, if you will, for why I hate apologetics. In the following video, you can watch Dr. J's response. Lord willing to keep my rambling to a minimum, I wrote my thoughts down, so hopefully it's relatively concise. We'll see. Make no mistake, this is no setup. I'm not going to throw my punches to make Dr. J look good. I want this to be intellectually honest. I want answers. I'm being honest with you when I say I kind of really do hate apologetics. And right now, and earlier today, I have like stomach pains with doing this because I know Dr. J can mop the floor <laughs> with any argument I throw out there. We'll see where this goes. Maybe he can work me through and show me the light of apologetics. Or maybe I can kind of help move the conversation and, and talk about how we can help move apologetics in the 21st century in a more healthy direction. I'm not against the concept of having sound logical reasons for why our faith is true. How could I be against that? Fundamentally, this beef I have is with how apologetics is applied. Okay, there are plenty of avenues we can venture down, but I want to start with one premise that has three examples to go along with it. So, here it goes. My hypothesis for Dr. J, and you, the apologist or apologist advocate watching me right now, is this. Apologetics gives too little credence to personal experience. Now, I'm painting with a broad brush, so I hope you'll forgive me when I say the apologist commits these errors. When more precisely, I mean much of the time, but not all the time, apologists discount personal experience. There are numerous examples of apologists who do indeed value personal experiences, such as Professor J.P. Moreland. Uh, he comes first to mind. That being said, while Peter extols us to be ready to give a defense for the hope we have, it seems to me that generally speaking, an apologist discounts any sort of lived experience as a valid defense. Now, my three examples or major areas where this discounting of personal experience is viewable are as follows. One, the apologist discounts supernatural experiences. Two, the apologist discounts the virtue of being seen as vulnerable and foolish in the eyes of the world. Three, the apologist discounts the impact of trauma and bias on our capacity to accept truth. All right, let me bloviate a little bit and break down each of those points a little further. First, the apologist discounts supernatural experiences. Discounting personal experience, especially supernatural experiences, creates a great deal of cognitive dissonance uh, because the whole of our faith is predicated on supernatural testimony. While Aquinas may have been the first to focus on natural theology, Natural theology without regarding personal experience and supernatural encounters with the Godhead as personally evidential surely must toss one head over heels into the throes of constant cognitive dissonance when faced with the consistent stories of supernaturalism revealed in the New Testament. Sorry, that sentence was too long. I should have edited it. John calls Jesus' miracles signs, and the great evangelist, the Apostle Paul, doesn't become a believer himself unless Jesus miraculously appears before him, speaks to him, blinds him, and then heals his blindness. Furthermore, just like Jesus, Paul uses healings and wonders to share the gospel. Additionally, even more so, he shares his personal supernatural testimony, or it's shared three times in Acts alone. While his reasoning at Mars Hill certainly gives us a template for how we can speak reasonably and rationally to others about our faith, Paul undoubtedly puts an emphasis on his own personal testimony in his approach to making disciples of all nations. Stories are abundant in recent years of Muslims coming to faith due to Jesus appearing to them in dreams. Shouldn't we spend more time listening to these testimonies instead of working on ways to show the utility of leading a Christian life? Now, I'll grant you that a personal testimony from a stranger doesn't hold much water for you or me generally. The Mormons like to count on that special burning in the bosom we're supposed to get when reading the Book of Mormon. Obviously, I'm skeptical of that experience. However, when I'm in relationship with someone, and I know them to be trustworthy of character, 
not driven to drama or sensationalism, and they recount a supernatural experience, shouldn't I hold that with some esteem? Shouldn't I count my path to finding Jesus, whether supernatural or not, as part of my apologetical approach in all places and at all times? When we try to divorce our own experience or the experience of others from apologetics, I think we may be implying that claiming allegiance to Christ is a solely intellectual or even scientific exercise. Secondly, the apologist discounts the virtue of being seen as vulnerable and foolish in the eyes of the world. When we debate, the crowd judges. There is a winner and there is a loser. Naturally, we want our arguments to win. We want to leave the stage as the bestest debater with the bestest arguments. And yet, Jesus states the first will be last, and Paul reinforces the idea when he says in 1 Corinthians 1.27, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak in the world to shame the strong. It's like this, whenever I hear a pastor on Sunday morning recounting some big spiritual win that that specific person has committed for the kingdom, I kind of tend to roll my eyes, but when the preacher confesses his missed opportunities or their shortcomings, I lean in. We connect to brokenness. We empathize with it. Blessed are the poor in spirit. But when we practice apologetics, it almost always turns into a strong man aesthetic. At best, we look magnanimous in victory. At worst, we appear vindictive, angry, pharisaical, especially when debating theology with fellow believers. And we appear divisive. It becomes perhaps impossibly difficult to exude the fruit of the Spirit in these instances. I lump this in with personal experience, this argument, because it then becomes the experience that people have with us rather than the logic of our dictation that leads to their lasting impressions of Christians who are walking in the spirit of truth and love. This is a, a matter of personal experience because it's not the words we're saying that are, is going to make the lasting impression on the crowd in the debate. They'll forget the arguments, but our, our character, the way we showed ourselves, that's what's gonna stick with people. That's just how humans are, I think. Apologetics tends to frame the conversation as an in-crowd and an out-crowd, a winner and a loser. The apostles could stand to debate and proclaim the name of Jesus in confrontational forums, perhaps in part because they knew the cost of doing so. They knew that they would, at least in the world's eyes, lose. But our culture honors those who are viewed as the strongest person in the room. We are inclined to idolize our pastors and our leaders. By going on the apologetical debate stage, the apologist is likely only to be lifted higher in our society. There is rarely a cost in the West of speaking to a crowd that is clinging to your every word. It often brings with it status, fame, and relative fortune. If you, instead of debating Matt Dillahunty on the debate stage, befriended him, played poker with him every second Saturday of the month, and then make a defense to Dillahunty when he asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you, you will not be seen as a winner in the eyes of the crowd. Rather, you'll be in relationship with a fellow sinner and offering up the truth to him that you know and love. Wouldn't that be a better way than to be potentially seen as conniving and vitriolic or as someone that should be idolized? I feel like I didn't flesh that out very well, but anywho, gotta move on lest this video be two hours long. Lastly, the apologist discounts the impact of trauma and bias on our society to accept truth. A failure to recognize personal experience as valid leads to the assumption that we ultimately have the ability to process information in a non-biased way. I don't believe this is ultimately how humans function. The easiest example of this I can point to is those who experience trauma. I saw a retweet, and I believe it was the apologist Mary Jo Sharp, good job Mary Jo, uh, that retweeted this. Um, it read, and this was b by at Lisa V. Fields, the connection between psychology and apologetics should not be overlooked. Trauma impacts how people see and uh, interact with truth. Two years ago, I might have agreed with that statement, but now I comprehend it on a visceral level. I have two boys who I've adopted through foster care. They have endured a ton, a ton in their lives. And I can see it on a daily basis, I see it. I see how their experiences have impacted how they 
interact with and understand many, many things almost across the board, particularly with the notion of love. The most extreme examples of this that we could point to would be those individuals who were raised feral. The stories of the real Tarzans of history are pretty darn horrific. And in every case I've read about, if a child missed human interactions in their formative years, they are utterly, utterly unable to become civilized later in life. Now, that's an extreme example, of course, but to some degree or another, every one of us is emotionally and developmentally impacted by the experiences we've had. Maybe we can't go so far as to say our experiences are too subjective to ever be able to relate ourselves to truth. I wouldn't say that, but our experiences impact how we prioritize and determine the importance of the information and data we receive. In order to properly respond to those biases, hurts, trauma, and first impressions, I'd like to argue that we do better by listening and making friends with our unbelieving neighbors. By knowing our neighbor, by praying for them and living beside them, we earn the right to be heard, and in doing so, the trigger warning that may go off in their heads when we talk about church, when we talk about God being our Father, or Jesus ransoming us as sinners. That trigger warning is alleviated because trust has already been secured in the relationship. I'm not sure you can instill trust from the stage. We can better serve our neighbor and defend our faith to them by praying for them and interacting with them daily than by working on more and more syllogisms to convince them of something they might not emotionally have the capacity to accept. All right, so after all that, I'll volley this over to you, Dr. J. What do you think of my hypothesis? Apologetics gives too little credence to personal experience.